Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sever Jalassi. I'm a freelance VFX artist and a Houdini instructor. And today I'm going to be talking about procedural rock formations in Houdini for Unreal uh, Engine 4 for games and for VFX as well. And uh, this is a part of a workshop that I'm working on. It's a 10 weeks workshop that will focus on uh, advanced asset creation in Houdini. Uh, so, and today I'm going to show a part of the workshop, which is the uh, procedural creation of the assets. So uh, I'm going to start by showing some, some references the, of the things that I'm going to be looking at to try and recreate that procedurally. And I have a few images here. You can see there's this mountain here. There is this cliff. And then there is these two images, which are a, a, a generic type of uh, cliffs and rocks and uh, rocks formations and things like that. And if I take these images and, and put them in black and white just to look at the lines and the values, what the eye is really looking for is a change in, in a sudden change in contrast and uh, a dark edge, a black lines. And this is what we see in all these images, especially this one here and this one. You can see there is a sudden change of contrast, which means depth change. Uh, along the height, the width, and various things. And then there is a sharp, sharp lines, which are uh, the, basically the cracks of the rocks. And these cracks can, um, can continue from top to bottom if you have a, a big cliff, or they can stop and then start somewhere else. And so cracks doesn't have to be continuous. And so these are the main elements that the eye, I think, will, will be looking for to say, this is a rock, this is a cliff, this is a big cliff. And the, the other aspect of uh, the, these rock formation is if you want to sell scale, the first thing that you need to add is the variation in terms of uh, detail. So you would have a big uh, cliff that has a flat surface, and along with that, there is a lot of uh, medium-sized details and a small-sized details. And then with, with that visual information, the eye can, can judge the scale without having any other reference in the environment, like a human or uh, a tree or something like that. So I'm going to try and, and see how, what ways we can achieve this in Houdini, how we can create this kind of geometry procedurally. So the first thing that comes to mind is to take, um, you know, is to use noise. And the first one that, that comes to mind is the, the whirly noise. And if you take the F2 minus F1, this is the whirly noise in Houdini, and you subtract the two, you get this nice pattern. And the, instead of using the position, the raw position, I'm adding a little bit of noise to that so it creates a little bit of breakup. And you can see that it works great on a surface, on a flat surface. And I can use this to create rocks and then add another level with big rocks and then maybe use the height to flatten some details and things like that. So this is, this is very simple. You can see the graph is very straightforward. But this works on a on a flat plane. If you try this on a very complex geometry, it, it fails quickly because what happens is we're pushing details, we're pushing the geometry along the normal. And so those edges of the box here, they will have a few polygons, but then they get pushed too far. So you get issues with the geometry. As well as if we have a complex, a concave mesh, and we're pushing details from this side and this side, there will be a lot of collision. So there will be a lot of collision that we cannot fix with geometry. So there is uh, so much that we can do with geometry to solve this problem. And the solution that we have in Houdini to, to uh, do this kind of stuff is to use volume. So instead of operating on the mesh on points, we were going to uh, use volume. So in this example, I have a sphere. And you can see that this is the domain. And Houdini can take any geometry and convert it into a volume. In this case, it's a Houdini, it's a VDB volume, and this is the format. Uh, I'm then taking this sphere here and I'm adding noise to it. And the way noise, the way we uh, uh, add noise to volume fields is by uh, running a volume sample, which is a very simple operation in, in volume vops. And instead of having this domain sample, let's say this point, instead of it's sampling that point, we tell it to look for something else in another different place, and that's what the noise will add. So this, this point here, for example, will look up a value here, and then this instead of this point, it will look up for something else that has a different density. And so we can start breaking this volume. 
And once we have that, we can, uh, we can do the same thing on a, uh, an SDF. Okay, so this is, I, I need this video. Oh, one second, sorry about that. So this is a first example, and instead of, uh, something happened, yeah. So instead of using the volume that I showed you, I'm using an SDF, which is a surface distance field, and it's basically a volume, let's think of it as a volume, but it gives us the luxury of looking at a volume like a surface instead of it being a, a, a transparent volume, we can see it as an actual surface. And this box here is a volume, it's an SDF. And it can start adding the Warley noise that I showed you guys in the beginning. But instead of adding it to the surface, I'm gonna add it to the volume. And by just doing that, you can see that we start to add details. We can actually push rocks out, push details out of the volume um, and they will, uh, the vol if you have it as, as a volume, it will solve all the collision issues and you will not have any problems with normals because there is none. So you can push details from anywhere and it will just work. You can take any complex geometry and, and convert it into volume and then use this Worley to add rocks details onto anything. And so this is example of me just pushing the noise too far. And you can see as I reach the boundaries, I start getting artifacts. So I need to expand the domain of this. So it's just a volume, basically. And so uh, the next example is, uh, is the same, was just a slight modification. So this is another uh, the, uh, box with the Worley added, and then I'm adding more noise, fine noise to the Worley itself, to the uh, noise pattern. So it breaks up those edges, and you can see we have all kinds of details that we can get into any surface that we want. So this is great. This is a very promising approach. We just, with a couple of nodes, we can take any geometry and add rocks to it. So this is how the graph looks like uh, for the volume sample. You can see uh, this is the final result that goes into the, the volume sample node. It's a, another node that just removed it to save space. And I'm adding a couple of noise here to the position, the scale of the Worley size to just add a little bit of variation so it's not uniform. And this is another example of uh, just that same deformer with uh, played with the noise a little bit more. And you can see what kind of details we can get. This is a sphere with just one, one deformer, the, the volume vault that we wrote. And you can see we have already rocks uh, uh, from our sphere. Cool, so the next thing is how we can take and make realistic cliffs out of this deck. Cool, so I'm gonna show uh, the final result and then I'll explain how I did this. So this is the, this is the uh, final mesh out of Houdini and this is entirely procedurally created along with the textures as well. So the, the main problem when you start uh, exploring various techniques in, in, in doing rocks in Houdini, you will have issues, you will have a big problem which is creating cracks. And the other thing is creating the silhouette of your cliff or your, or your element. And the easiest way, the best way to do this, I found, is to actually model that geometry, is to create it in Houdini with the cracks in there and then take it to a volume, um, uh, convert it into a volume and then add the extra details in there. So my approach is to, I'm gonna show the final mesh here for a second and then I'll show how, how I've done it. So this is the final surface and it's a high res rock that has about 7 million uh, polygons and this is 100% procedural. And you can see it has all kinds of uh, details with the you know, fine details, big details, you have the cliffs, you have the variation in, in depth, you have the cracks and you have all the elements uh, that needs. And the fact that we can say this is a rock from just looking at it is a gray shaded is, is a, great, uh, a great thing to have because that means that we're heading in the right direction. And one fun thing that happened, which is very ha hard to sculpt these details, uh, is you can get concaves, you can get holes because of the noise, the way that it, it, uh, it works. It can push details out, but not in the same way. So you can create holes, and this, this happened here. It's gonna give me a nightmare to UV, of course, later, 
but <laughs> it, it, it's very cool, and it's hard to sculpt these kind of details by hand. And so this is the final result, and this is the approach. I start off with a box, and I use the Voronoi fracture to basically break it up into, into uh, uh, chunks, into rock-like uh, uh, geometry. And then I take the outer pieces of that box and I delete it. You know, I don't, I delete everything that is in the surrounding. And then the interior of the, of the box, of the Voronoi, will have a very interesting depth variation. It will have all, all the, the basic uh, details that we need for our cliff. And then I, to add another level of complexity, I isolate certain pieces here and I fracture them again to add a variation in the size of the cracks. So these are, this groove is fractured again and then I deleted a little bit of pieces here just to randomize it and then I merged it back in into the original. So this is my base and this is very, very simple in Houdini to do. And by the way, I wanted to mention that this, uh, this workshop, it's, it has a lot of stuff, and part of it is the creation uh, of the rocks and cliff. It has no scripting, there is no programming, and you don't have to know anything about VEX or anything. And everything was done using Houdini Escape, so you don't need the, the full Houdini version if you wanted to do all of this. Um, so the next thing is uh, I wanted to take that original mesh, and before uh, before I take it into a volume, I wanted to deform those cracks because right now they are very specific lines because of the Warner. So we do a technique called edge displacement, which basically takes the, the we take the, the flat polygon, we compute the tangent and then push, push along the, that tangent. And so we can uh, deform the, the surface without changing the silhouette. We just add details in the cracks. And then here, you can see uh, there is a lot of pieces here. I just picked some and removed them by hand. And here I'm using uh, pack primitives. So this is a pack primitive and I can grab in the viewport and can select the pieces that I want to remove and chuck them out to create more breakups. I can also select pieces and, and treat them, uh, add something to them and then put them back. And so this is the original mesh and then I convert that into an SDF, which is a volume basically. And this is the actual representation from the viewport in Houdini with the volume. And then that, this SDF is then run through the, vol, uh, the noise operation that I showed uh, mixed with various other noise just to add a little bit more breakup. And that's the final surface, that's it. I, there's, nothing, um, uh, there's nothing added after that. And this is the final, the final high res mesh. And of course we can take this high res create a low res and generate the maps for it, which we're gonna show uh, in a second. So, because we have everything procedural and working, I can generate hundreds of thousands of these without any issues. So just for, for this presentation, I, I uh, randomized the seed of the Voronoi points that I used for the fracturing, and these are uh, different versions that I've created in like 20 minutes just for waiting for the for the network to cook. And because I used a lot of voxels, it takes uh, about five minutes. So this is the first version which, which I showed. It's about, I think, eight million poly. And you can, of course, uh, generate low res versions without any issues by changing the uh, voxel count and the details won't change. You will just, it will get blurrier and, and blurrier every time. So this is one version, this is another one. And I didn't change, again, just the randomization of the point and you can see you get different details. This is another version. And you know, people uh, would ask me like, we, you know, we lose the flexibility of the artistic stuff. Well, if you, have, if you have a reference that you need to reproduce exactly as it is, you know, go photo scan it. You have it, go photo scan it. Don't, don't try re-sculpt it. If you have a specific crack that you need to paint or uh, you know, sculpt and have a director sitting next to you, use a 3D uh, sculpting. But if you need hundreds of thousands of rocks that you then would like to look at some of them, say, I want this, 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 this is the tool to use. So I can generate hundreds of thousand, do uh, turntable, do renders, and then show it to the art director and say, which one you like? You know, I'll, I'll grab 10, we use those 10 in the pipeline. So this is the flexibility that this workflow gives you. And there is just so many things that we can do, I'm gonna continue. Uh, so these are just some variation you can see by 
uh, every time it picks a different pieces to delete and stuff like that. And you can see uh, you can see the cracks that I was talking about. The basically the variation in depth. We can see there is a lot of push and, and pull. There's a lot of fine cracks. There is a lot of cavity, which is a big, big thing and very hard to sculpt as well to get these kind of uh, cavities and have details on them. Um, so these are more variation and it's endless. I can run this forever and put it on Turbo Squid and sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think I've done. Uh, this is a little bit more variation with the same, the same workflow. Uh, but I try to use uh, different techniques. For example, this is, could be used for an alien-like uh, 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 creature or something or an environment asset for an alien-like design. Uh, this is just copying different uh, Voronoi pieces into uh, a tube, basically, and having them pointing this way and then adding noise. Uh, these guys are the same as this. I just deleted more pieces. Instead of having delete just the outer layer, I deleted more pieces, so it gave me these kind of sharp details. This is the same, just deleting random pieces. And you can see how flexible the workflow is um, to, and again, I can randomize this a lot. So we're gonna take this one, uh, one step further. We wanna do this type of stuff. And this is, again, 100% procedurally generated in Houdini. Uh, the texture is a real texture, but later in the course, we'll have it fully procedural. So we're gonna look at how we can do this, uh, this type of stuff which I think has everything that a realistic cliff would have. And this element looks very, in a specific way, if you have the, sh the peaks point downward versus upwards. It's just a visual illusion, uh, but I've used it in, in two different ways and we'll show you guys. So these are just still images from the cliff. And we're gonna look at the approach. So it's the same thing. I, instead of starting with uh, uh, the Instead of starting with that bo specific box, I started with this one, which has, uh, it sh it's a little bit elongated. And then I Voronoi that, add edge displacement to break it up. And then I use, uh, I basically pick pieces that I like from inside. So these are just pieces from inside. And then this is from the other side. Uh, I think from the top, just basically two sides that are flat. And then I combine those, so I have these two, these two guys are meeting at flat, flat edges. And this is my start geometry. And then all I do to it is, I, this is the base geo, convert it into an SDF, add the noise. And everything will just work. Now, with this noise, it's a little bit more advanced. And the, the Worley or the Voronoi noise, that gives you a seed number. And that seed means you can randomize. It gives you basically a unique number per block, so if you have a grid and there is a uh, cells for the Worley, you can get ra randomized color. And I use that information to vary the, how much it pushes. So with the noise and everything, I get these interesting cracks. And it will also cause a sharp change in depth because one block will push, push a lot of details out and one, another uh, part will get pushed in. So it'll get a lot of push, push and pull. And also if the detail is push too much, it will create a gap in between in some parts. So we'll see that as well. And again, this is this is very simple networks in Houdini and there is no scripting. This is a turntable of the cliff uh, rendered. I've copied it a few times and rotated it and basically did render. So this is, this is how it looks like. And this is the uh, final geo, I think it's about four million uh, polygons, and again, the resolution is not really important, just uh, how much details you would need in the mesh. Cool, so let's see. So the next example is this. I took the same approach. Instead of using the, uh, that, pol that box, I picked another one. I did two boxes this time, one at the top, one at the bottom, and I deleted pieces from the outer layer. So these just, I removed stuff, and then same thing here, and then I added the noise. That's all about it, that you convert it into a volume and then you add the noise. Um, there is, you can add actually tones and you do uh, volume processing, which I will show. You can actually push details further if you need to. Uh, there is so many uh, data that we can uh, use to add any kinds of 
information we want in the visual. So if you like, to add, if you wanted to add pebbles, if you wanted to analyze this volume and place specific pieces based on the cavity or things like that, you can definitely do that. So this is one piece, the front and back. And then um, um, all these assets together, we're gonna build an environment with them and I'll show you. Uh, this is another uh, piece. I started with three boxes uh, and deformed them a little bit and then started doing the Voronoi uh, fracturing and adding uh, the, the volume deformation. Now the volume here is a little bit different. I used more push and pull with the Voronoi. So I used the seed and, and pushed the volume in and out a bit more to get uh, this complexity. Cool, so the next element is, uh, is very similar, but instead of starting with a, uh, with a box, I started with multiple grids and then each one of them I Voronoid it in a specific way. So it has different cuts and then I pushed, I extruded that. And then I run the same uh, volume operation on it. And for this logo, because it's a, it's a volume field, I can take, I can generate any other volume fields and do uh, um, operation. I can subtract volume. And this is very, very precise. Like it's, it's very fast and very precise. So you can actually ha delete uh, chunks from here and change them with other materials. You can have, uh, you can remove whole section of this and add, for example, a destroyed wall or a destroyed details or beams coming out of it. And it's super, super easy to do. Uh, so the next one is, is the same version with just less, uh, less deformation. So this is just a little bit of uh, uh, push and pull. And you can see how these details are coming out, this detail. The base geometry is very simple for this, but then with the, with the, with the volume uh, processing, it, there's a lot that gets added to it. Uh, this is another one. And again, it's procedural. So this is 100 versions that I run with just changing the noise. And I can, uh, I, I did render them, and then I can show this and, you know, to whomever needs to decide or, and they can say, okay, I like this piece, I like this variation. You can see here, for example, uh, the, the variation and the chunk size is changing as well. So, and there is just very little uh, variation that I'm changing in the graph and let it cook for the night. I think this 100 versions, uh, very high res, 4 million each, like took about six hours to finish and they're very high res meshes. So it, it will continue. There's a lot, so you can use that. And then, um, so once we have all these assets, we can then uh, take them to VFX, like if you wanna render them in Mantra or anything, that you can use the high res mesh. But for games, we need to generate the low res version. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take this, the cliff, this is actually the one that I mentioned it's pointing downward, it's now pointing upward. Um, and then I converted that into a VDB. So the final mesh, I generated a volume from it, and then I used that volume to generate a, a low res mesh. And this is very easy to do in Houdini. So this is a low res mesh, I think it's about 20K. Uh, and then with using Mantra, we can bake textures. So I, uh, sorry, before we get to the te texture baking, uh, I need to generate UVs. So there is many ways you can do this in Houdini. You can select, you can use the uh, nearest point and select specific edges that you use to unwarp the mesh. Uh, but in this case, I wanted to set up something automatic. So in Houdini, there is a, a node that can cluster a point cloud. So you can give it a mesh and say, I wanna cluster it. I will try to group each set of points into a, a group by themselves. So in here, this is the original mesh, I give it, um, six points uh, going from top to bottom and three points going this way. So it's nine points and it, it gave me back nine clusters. So these are my clusters. And then what I do is I find the edge of each cluster. So I loop over each cluster and say, okay, what's the edge? What's the limit? And then this is the limit of each cluster. I then copy that back into the mesh and use it to select the edges. So um, I now have a selection that can, that groups each group of polygons together and it can use that to unwarp the mesh. This requires a little bit of uh, interactive, so you have to see, uh, look at the UVs to make sure that there is no issues. And this is basically what I was able to get uh, out of the box. And this graph can work with any kinds of geometry. Um, the next thing is, so now that we have UVs, we can basically take this 
high res, low res and high res and bake the maps that we need. So this is occlusion, normal maps, uh, cavity maps, vector displacement, displacement, cavities, thickness, uh, P and N, things like, so you can bake anything, you can add custom AVs if you want to as well. And then uh, I took that for Unreal. So this is the low res mesh uh, front and back. And then I applied the normal map that I generated. And this is with the normal map uh, applied. And then uh, this is a graph in, Houdini, in Unreal Engine. So I have a texture here. I'm using the triplanar texturing. And then this is the normal maps and I use the occlusion maps. And I've went through multiple assets. So I did that cliff that I showed at the beginning. I did the wall. I, convert, I deformed it to become circular. I created another element for the ground. And then this is the final, uh, this is the final uh, version. So let me open it in high res instead. So this is running in Unreal. It's uh, one, two, it's four assets only. And um, the, that, this big wall here is the one I showed front and back and I bended it and I just baked the maps for all of them, and imported them in Unreal and started putting things together. So this is one environment and this is the cliff, the sharp cliff that I showed. It's here it's pointing upward, here it's pointing downward. And this is all running in 60 FPS. I am not a real time expert, so this is the first time I, I've used Unreal. Um, uh, it's running 60 FPS on a 680 GTX. And I just added some lights and it was a fun experience. So uh, this is another element. I used similar techniques and I think it was much simpler to create that. Um, I didn't have to do a lot of noise, it just created a, a circle, added noise, and then deform, uh, rotated that and copied it back. And this is, this is the environment. And everything, was, um, everything has UVs on it, textured. Uh, all was done in Houdini. And this is one other um, thing that I wanted with this course. I didn't want to use any other package. I want everything to be done in Houdini. And these textures are actually procedurally generated in Houdini using Houdini cops. So everything was done in Houdini and uh, we'll go over all the details in, in the workshop, hopefully. So this is the Unreal Engine. And I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show uh, a, this is, this version is rendered in Arnold. I didn't use any normal displacement or anything. And um, it's using the high res mesh. So it's about 28 million uh, polygons without instancing. And the final count is like 900 billion. And this is all rendered together. Like there is no compositing, there is no displacement. Everything is with actual mesh. And these are all the elements that pretty much showed here. Uh, these are the cliffs. And uh, there is this one that I showed as well, which is a different variation. And then I did another version. Uh, so this is another version with atmosphere. Cool. So I wanted to show two more uh, two more things that I've done after the slide is done. So I wanted to show high res renders of how can I get zoom in? Okay. Yes. So these are the this is the cliff that I showed the first one. And these, this, is, this texture is created in Houdini as well. So 100% Houdini. And the render was done in Mantra. And this is, there's no displacement I didn't generate. I used the high res mesh. You can see all kinds of details here. Uh, this is one, you can see this crack here, for example. And these are the pieces where I deleted to create more details. And there is just so much detail here. And there is no, uh, there is a little bit of map, bump mapping, but there is no displacement or anything. And all these details are coming in the textures as well. So this is one element that I liked. Uh, this is, yeah, this is another one with uh, d just a different shading here. And then, uh, let's see. 
this is the wall and I think it was not very obvious the amount of details but this is the close-up of the actual render you can see how much details there is and then this is another one uh, I didn't show in the presentation but uh, it uses very similar techniques it's just I pushed the noise a little bit more to give me more of these uh, you know the kind of rocks that you can find next to the shore with the cavities and the these kind of cracks and things like that and this is again a, a straight render out of Arnold with the with the high res mesh and then the last one is that wall but shaded using procedural textures and let me show the I'm trying to get 100% so I don't show I don't know how so this is the amount of details that we have And there is no displacement here. It's all in the mesh. There is a only texture, uh, procedural texture and bump applied to the mesh. Cool. Uh, let's see. Go ahead, show this, show this. Uh, I wanted to thank these guys, Igor Zanik, Andreas Bystrom, Urban Bradesco. Magnus Larsen, Bronik Bedranek, uh, Johnny Farmville, Side Effects, and Solid Angle for all the help and support during the making of this workshop, which I'm still working on, but hopefully you guys have an idea of what the content is about. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. <laughs> questions? I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try. There we go, <laughs> teamwork. So with your procedural texture, it looked like it was taking into account actual topology from the mesh. Was that the case that like, was it? No, it's a 2D texture. Um, and it's a, I have a system that can make any texture tileable. And then I use tree planner, which basically like, uh, it uses uh, the normals of the mesh to create the UV coordinate on the fly. In some other cases, I had proper UV, so I can use that uh, UVs. Um, I used the curvature of the mesh to mix in a little bit of details, but that's about it. Cool. Any other questions? With those holes and stuff, did you have problems with the UVs? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah, so uh, uh, so you can what you can do is you can shift click on the edge, shift A, and then hold shift A, and you can pick a target, and it will find the nearest path, give you an edge selection. Uh, there is a tool by Lu uh, Louis Louis Creel that helps with creating uh, selections like this, and you have to find uh, basically do a, an edge selection by hand in there. You can try with the method that I showed to cluster and make sure that that piece gets a proper. Uh, group so it unworks correctly, but again, it's a, only a small section and most of the techniques I used worked in the UV process. Sure. Did you try, uh, did you try like um, 3D uh, textures so you didn't have to do like UV unwrapping or? Yeah, I did, I did. I used the tree planner which basically doesn't require a UV so you can, it can map the te uh, textures to the geometry directly. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. What's but for Tree planner, Tree planner? Okay. yeah, but for uh, for games, I need the I need the UVs because I need to bake that. Right. I need the information to bake the textures into. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the part where you did the uh, bundle factor uh -huh. and you remove like the pixel would be another point. Yeah. Uh, do you do it by hand selection or do you have like some sort of normal? No, I it, so it, the box is like this. I have another uh, delete, no delete node that has box the, with the box region. So I just scaled it to only select the stuff in, inside and then it deletes everything else. Exactly, yeah, you can change that to fit. Um, I didn't go and try to make everything procedural because my goal was to get specific assets done, but it, you can, there's so many controls that you can uh, add to make the system 100% procedural and you know you can stretch the box and it will give you a wall 
you can squeeze it and it will give you uh, a cliff, a sharp cliff and something like that. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, I was wondering if you could describe a little bit of the uh, workflow, if there's more of a, like an established workflow for the edge displacement. That's one that seems like there's been a lot of kind of batting sure. around of ideas around. So, uh, <laughs> So my method is very simple. I have, uh, especially with the Vorn, I prefer to do it best with on simple geometry. So you have the Vorn OE pieces, uh, you have the inside edge and they have the exterior edge. Each of these faces have a normal. The exterior, I take the tangent, compute the tangent, and that's the vector I will push the normals. And then I take the interior parts and I transfer the normal. So the exterior pieces, would transfer their normal back into the interior faces. So it will, by distance, basically, each one will get the proper tangent that it needs to go uh, towards. And that's it, yeah. The, the other problem is to do the UVs, to fix the UVs. <laughs> that's, that's uh, I didn't have to worry about that. Cool, do you guys have any other questions? <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> so with uh, resampling from noise, I noticed in some cases you can get like where little things floating outside. Yes. Um, how do you get rid of those? Yeah. So uh, you put down an assemble node, which okay. will assemble all the pieces by connectivity, and then you uh, you can compute the 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 volume of the uh, of all the pieces, find the biggest, and delete everything else because the biggest will be your piece, or you can select it in the viewport and say, I want to keep this, delete everything else. Yeah, so that's how we do it. Cool, okay, well, thanks everyone for uh, coming.